So we're going to move on to theme five now, which is about lower lake psychology. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, my name is Jason Nickel. I'm a senior research scientist at Saudi Aquatic Sciences and my area of expertise is aquatic and floodplain vegetation. Uh, apologies for not being able to deliver this talk in person. In uh, particular, apologies to Amy, Kirsty, and Nicole. Um, I'm not sure the last thing you wanted to hear was that one of your speakers was unable to show up today. Um, today I'm gonna to be talking um, about the uh, ecology of the lower lakes. Uh, my component is we're going to be talking about the Living Murray Vegetation Monitoring and uh, after I've done that I'll hand over to Scott Wedderburn and he's going to talk about the Threatened Fish Monitoring and uh, Southern Bell Frog Monitoring. As I mentioned earlier we're going to start at the bottom of the food chain with the, uh, the Vegetation Monitoring. Okay, it's working. Um, the, uh, I don't need to uh, remind everybody um, that vegetation is an important component of the uh, aquatic ecosystems. Uh, they provide a wide range of ecosystem services. I'm not going to go into that in great detail because I don't have time. Um, but what I will just mention briefly is that there's been a reasonable amount of studies on the vegetation in the lower lakes. Uh, I've listed several of them here. Uh, apologies if I've forgotten any or I've um, omitted any. Um, I'm not going to talk about them in great detail. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm going to mention uh, um, a few of them um, because they are either complementary to the Living Murray Condition Monitoring or they provided us with some, uh, some baseline information. I uh, just want to start with the 2004 and 2005 wetland baseline surveys. They were snapshots undertaken in spring 2004 and 2005, and they were important because they were taken during the millennium drought, but it was before we uh, started to get the uh, low flows in the Murray and the uh, water levels in the lakes had um, had fallen to below sea level. So these two uh, wetland baseline surveys, whilst they were only snapshots, they gave us an indication of what the vegetation was like prior to the water levels dropping in the lower lakes. Um, whilst the uh, water levels were low, we um, undertook a couple of seed bank assessments. Um, now the seed bank assessments were important because they gave us an opportunity to see how the vegetation would respond after uh, water levels were reinstated. And they did show that there was actually a quite a healthy seed bank in um, the areas where we were able to, uh, to get samples. And the last one was a, a piece of complementary work that I um, undertook, and this was um, done um, after water levels were reinstated, but it was looking at the um, assessing the success of planting river club rush around the shorelines of Lake Alexandrina and Albert. Now, for those of you not familiar with the uh, river club rush plantings, uh, it was planted in um, typically about 50 centimetres of water uh, along the shorelines of um, Lakes Alexandrina and Albert, and its primary aim was to stop erosion. Uh, it proved to be worked very well in stopping erosion, but it also meant that the um, the area between the shoreline and the river club rush was an area where um, diverse um, plant communities were able to recruit. So I had um, you know, that un uh, unexpected uh, bonus of in improving biodiversity just by planting one species. Getting on to the uh, Living Murray condition monitoring, the um, the condition monitoring was designed to evaluate um, TLM target V3, and that was to maintain or improve aquatic and littoral veg vegetation in the lower lakes. And that's all well and good. However, without a uh, proper baseline, we weren't actually able to measure uh, the success or failure of, of this target. So in conjunction with Wayne, Wayne Robinson, a uh, biometrician from Charles Sturt University, who um, undertook a review of all the TLM condition monitoring, um, we, 
<coughs> excuse me, we developed a series of targets that were measurable, um, which resulted in there being 42 targets for vegetation uh, for the lower lakes. Now, I'm not going to, in any detail, talk about those 42 targets because it, um, it requires me to present 42 different graphs, um, which I don't have time and I'm sure you don't actually probably want to look at. Um, the, um, but what it did result, it meant that we were able to properly assess um, whether the targets were achieved or not, but also we were able to track the, the uh, success and failure of the targets through time and to see whether we were, whether the vegetation was trending um, towards a target um, or away from a target. So, um, you know, we might be able to say we only met, you know, 10 out of the 42 targets, um, but a further 20 were actually trending in the right direction. So it's likely that those targets will be met in the future. Um, the, uh, the first surveys of the condition monitoring program were taken in spring 2008. And if you think back to spring 2008, the lower lakes were very different to where they were then. Um, you know, we're coming towards the end of the millennium drought and water levels were very low in the lower lakes. Um, surveys were undertaken typically in spring when the lake levels were high and in autumn when lake levels were low. And um, I'm not going to go too much into too much detail about methods, but they were replicated quadrat based surveys. And um, this photo here shows me, a, I don't think I'm obscuring it too much, a silhouette of me uh, on a quite windy day struggling to uh, set out a quadrat using a uh, measuring tape. Um, this slide shows the location of the monitoring sites. Um, to assess the targets, we split the lower lakes into five different habitats. Uh, Lake Alexandrina, Lake Albert, self-explanatory, uh, Gulwa Channel, which was the area between the Clayton Regulator and Gulwa Barrage, which included the lower reaches of the Finnis River and Currency Creek. Um, we surveyed permanent wetlands, <coughs> excuse me, and um, as their name suggests, they are wetlands that are permanently connected to the lower lakes and always have water in them. And um, temporary wetlands. And the temporary wetlands um, typically were connected with the lakes in spring and had water in them in spring and they would dry out over summer and autumn. This slide shows the water levels from August 2008 to May 2020. Um, it shows also where some of the uh, the major interventions that were undertaken, in particular during the Millennium Drought to control acid sulfate soils, were, were also undertaken. Um, the first intervention was the Narung Bund that was constructed at Narung Narrows and that was to prevent water levels from falling um, to levels that would result in acidification of Lake Albert. Uh, water was also pumped from Lake Alexandrina into Lake Albert to maintain high water levels. Uh, the second intervention was the Clayton Regulator. Uh, that was designed to make sure water levels, again, didn't fall too low in um, the Gould Channel, um, and also to capture water flowing from the eastern Mount Lofty Ranges. Uh, and, all, and to supplement that, water was pumped from Lake Alexandrina to maintain water levels. Um, in spring 2010, uh, flow um, returned to the uh, Lower Murray and the regulators were breached and water levels returned to historical levels in the Lower Lakes. Um, and from about 2016 onwards, um, we've been undertaking lake level cycling. So we, at times in spring, we were surcharging the lakes to wet up the uh, higher elevation littoral zone and uh, drawing them down in autumn to allow um, littoral vegetation to recruit as some of it requires a drying cycle to recruit. Um, the um, the three photos, which unfortunately I am obscuring, the the bottom one show uh, my site at Tolderol Point um, during spring 2008 and 2009 when water levels were low, and um, 
Unfortunately, my head's in the way there, um, but in spring 2010, water levels were reinstated and it actually shows um, a shoreline with water. Um, some important points before I explain this slide about the, uh, the condition monitoring program. We recorded 154 species of plants during uh, the condition monitoring program. Uh, but 75 of them were weeds. However, 31 were only recorded when lake levels were low. Uh, so the abundance of pest plants is a lot now, a lot less now than it was during the drought. And Ceratophyllum demersum is the only plant of conservation significance um, in the lower lakes, which is a submerged plant that's listed as rare in South Australia. Uh, on this slide, there are two ordinations. Now, the best explanation of an ordination I heard recently was uh, the graphs that scientists show people to confuse them. Um, that's probably a uh, case most of the time. Um, but really, all they are is just something that allows us to um, display multidimensional data, which our brains can't comprehend, into a um, format that our brains can comprehend. Um, and all you really need to know about these plots is that two points that are close together means that they are floristically very similar and two points that are a long way apart are very different. And they're really good at showing the, um, the you know, trajectory and change through time. I'm going to quickly look at the, discuss the uh, the change through time in a couple of the, uh, the habitats. So firstly, Gould Channel uh, and then temporary wetlands. So in Goolwa Channel in spring 2008 and 2009, we had low water levels and the vegetation was dominated by terrestrial species. A Clayton Regulator was built. Um, water levels rose. Uh, also, there was elevated salinity and the plant community was dominated by the submerged plant Ponomagin pectinatus. Uh, there was reconnection with Lake Alexandrina and a de decrease in salinity. Uh, there was an increase in submergent vegetation. Um, these two points here represented um, low water levels, uh, which was brought about by water level cycling to reduce salinity in Lake Albert. And pretty much since then, there's been very little change in the vegetation of um, Gould Channel. The temporary wetlands, they showed a very different pattern, as you would expect, seeing that they are hydrologically very different from um, Gould Channel. In spring 2008 and 2009, water levels were low. They were completely disconnected from the lakes and the only water that was in them was from local rainfall. Um, and there was very little submergent vegetation. Um, in autumn two, uh, 2009 and 2010, they were dry and dominated by terrestrial species. Spring 2010 represented a reconnection with the lower lakes. And from then on in autumn, when uh, the wetlands are typically dry, um, they were dominated by amphibious species, so species that are adapted to wetting and drying. Um, shortly after the drought, sort of for the first sort of three years after the uh, water levels were reinstated, the wetlands were inundated every spring, but submergent species were increasing each year. And in recent years, and unfortunately you can't see that text there, but the, uh, the vegetation of these wetlands has been dominated by submergent species in spring. So summing up, the, uh, the TLM has provided a valuable data set and uh, that data has been used to manage lake water levels. Uh, I mean the, uh, it's, a, it's a very good data set. It's spanned multiple political cycles and we're starting to get data that um, you know, has a time frame that's ecologically meaningful and you know, I'd like to you know give kudos where it's due because um, due and uh, the Murray Basin Authority have really supported this monitoring and it's um, provided a, uh, a really really useful data set that you know otherwise wouldn't have been collected um, you know surprise surprise water level is the key driver of the vegetation um, but one thing we did find and I probably neglected to mention this earlier um, but there's a narrow band of um, vegetation around the lower lakes and when you remove water 
uh, from that narrow band of, of vegetation. The submergent species disappear and they nothing recruits further down the elevation gradient. So water level needs to be kept um, at higher levels to um, provide conditions that are suitable for aquatic plants. Uh, one thing that we've found is that the vegetation is resilient, not just with the sea bank studies, but how the vegetation has responded when water levels were reinstated. And it's looking like now with the data we've collected in recent years that the community may be trending, in particular the places that are permanently inundated, to a more stable community. Um, so things are not changing like they were during the drought. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, I'm not sure, but I'll... Um, end there and hand you over to Scott. So thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to contact me. Um, the Jew people have my contact details. Thank you. <laughs> well done.